All right, hello, Honors 110. I uh, hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving recess there. Um, we're in our final week of class here, right? So um, I know a number of you did turn in essays uh, before the Thanksgiving break. Um, so, you know, I, I appreciate folks who did that. Um, to be transparent, I have read the early submission essays at this point. Um, I usually hold off on submitting scores and feedback um, just in case anyone does change their mind and did want to submit a, a different essay, essentially. Um, and kind of relinquish the uh, extra point that they gained by submitting early in favor of turning in what they consider a better essay. Um, I don't want to stop you from doing that or complicate that by submitting a grade and then creating that gray area of whether or not you're allowed to submit something again. So know that if you would like to submit something again, you're welcome to. Um, and, and also, I should just mention, this is not a way of trying to subversively say people should resubmit. Um, I think most people who did submit um, before uh, Thanksgiving will probably be really happy with their scores. Uh, there, there was some really good work on the whole from those essays. But nonetheless, um, for those folks, I expect I'll be giving you your feedback uh, Thursday of this week. Um, and then I'm going to be grading remaining papers on a rolling basis. Um, my, my hope is to get the essays back to you in under a week, um, just because we'll be getting the finals week. And I know people get anxious about grades and all of that. So um, rest of it, I'm going to try to, to you know finish those up as soon as I'm uh, you know reasonably able to do so. Um, with that, also just wanted to uh, make mention, so um, December 3rd, um, this Wednesday obviously is the, or this Thursday, excuse me, is the uh, due date for essay number three. Um, so, you know, as usual, you know, do 11 a.m. on Canvas. Um, so, you know, look forward to receiving those. And then um, December 8th is the final due date for any work in this class. So, um, if you did fall behind on, on one or more of the essays, I will still accept them. There'll be a late penalty attached to that, but um, still fair game to submit them by December 8th to get some credit for them. And some credit is definitely better than no credit for those major assignments. Um, also, reading response journals. Um, if you had any of those uh, still outstanding at this point, um, a number of you now are done with that aspect of the class. You've turned in 18 or more of them. So, you know, thank you for, for tending to that and for your uh, thoughtful responses there. And many of you are close. We only have, you know, two or three left to go. Um, that, that's not a bad place to be at all. Um, some of you have quite a ways to go, though, where you only have um, fewer than five entries in at this point. Um, so know that I will still accept them um, until noon on December 8th. Um, the other thing I'll note is um, if you need more time than that, if you're in a situation where, for example, um, you have exams or other assignments that are due on the 8th, it'd be really hard to finish everything up for the 8th. Um, but if you had one extra day, it would make all, all the difference in the world. Um, let me know your situation. I'm willing to hear people out on that sort of thing if I know what's happening in advance um, and could potentially give people, you know, an extra, you know, day or so. It's probably about the upper limit of what I can give. Um, if I don't hear from you, though, and if you have all of your work in, um, the afternoon of December 8th, I'm planning to start inputting final grades. Um, if you let me know before that that something else is coming or that you have an unusual situation or whatnot, um, I can usually work with you on that. Um, if I go ahead and submit your final grade, though, and then you submit some extra reading response, journals or then you submit a late essay, um, it gets into a really complicated territory where, um, where, whereas at this point, it's no problem at all to you know, still read something, grade something, update your grade. Um, after I submit final grades, um, it's a pretty big ordeal to try to change those grades. Um, some of that's, you know, work on my part of completing some forms and communicating with some deans and whatnot. Um, but more to the point, um, your transcript will almost certainly be wrong if you if you submit work that would change your grade after that point, and I, and I don't know. Um, so either I say, no, I can't accept the work at all, um, or if it seems a situation where legitimately there's a misunderstanding, um, I might try to cut you some slack and still accept some late work, um, but but know that it's going to be a complication for you and for me. And again, your transcript will probably be wrong for a few months if you do that. Um, so again, this is meant as you know threats or kind of you know doomsday stuff. Uh, and for the overwhelming majority of you, um, you're, you're on top of things. Um, your, your essays have been coming in, or your essay number three even is in already, um, and you're doing well on journals. And this shouldn't you know, really be a concern. But for the, those small handful of folks who are pretty behind on journal entries or turning in late essay work, um, yeah, I just wanted to put that all on the table um, and hope that's clear enough. Um, but okay, so with all that said, um, we're, we're in our last two classes. So I know I gave you some pretty substantial reading for this time. Um, there is a reading assignment for next time. Um, it's significantly less substantial. So there's a very short essay by Stephen Moore uh, called What Was True Then that I'm asking you to read for next time. It's only basically three pages long. Um, and there is an excerpt from Amy Kurzweil's book, Flying Couch. Um, it's a graphic memoir. Um, so um, 
they're, they're graphic novels. I think more people are familiar with. They're kind of like comic books, essentially, in their presentation. Um, this is a graphic memoir. It's telling a real story from her life. Um, so it's 25 pages long. Um, I expect it's probably about the same amount of time you would spend reading that as the three pages of Stephen Moore, just because of the way it's presented, um, how illustration intensive it is, so on and so forth. Um, Amy Kurzweil was actually at UNLV last year around this time, um, doing a residency at the Black Mountain Institute. So um, she has some connections to the area. Uh, and I think it's a really enjoyable piece just kind of to, to wrap up our semester on. So uh, with those final two readings for next time, um, for those who haven't completed it yet, essay number three is officially due for next time. Um, make sure you're staying on top of all, all those pieces. Um, but to get to the readings we had for today. So, so first there was the Elizabeth McCracken story, Property. Um, so for this one, um, it, it's, uh, it's a story I considered, again, kind of post-unit, though I think you could place it in the um, relationship, sex, and love unit, and it would make some sense. Um, so I'm going to start just by reading the very beginning of this story. Um, this is our, our main character, Stoney, kind of recounting. Um, you know, I, I, people have seen these honest versions of um, tr movie trailers where um, you know, they, they kind of comedically break down what actually happens in a movie relative to all the action-packed kind of sequences that the real trailer shows. Um, I think of this as being a similar aesthetic to that, where um, Stoney is kind of breaking down wh what the, this rental property he's taken on really looks like in contrast to um, you know, the way it was probably presented in the original ad he saw. So it says, the ad should have said, for rent, six-room hovel, uh, quarter-filled Mrs. Butterworth's bottle in living room, sandy sheet throughout, lingering smell, or wanted, gullible tenant for small house, must possess appreciation for chipped pottery, mid-1960s abstract silkscreen canvases, mouse-nibbled books on Georgia O'Keeffe, or available June 1st, shithole. Excuse my language, but that's, that's what uh, Elizabeth McCracken wrote here. Um, so in, in rendering it this way, I think we immediately get a, a portrait of this rental property, right? Um, what, where it's obviously kind of run down, where um, it's uh, not all it's purported to be. Um, these are sort of, I could imagine someone seeing some pieces of this as sort of homey details, um, but I think by and large, most of us would consider it, you know, this is a rental that I'm paying for, um, disappointing, right? Um, kind of gross in some ways. Um, but in addition to that, we're also getting an immediate portrait of Stoney, uh, the, our, our main character for this story and kind of his mindset at this point. Um, you know, he, he is pretty cynical looking into this. Um, and he's, he's kind of clever. I mean, I, th I think that the, these the details he's picking up on his descriptions, um, they, they aren't kind of the work of someone who's, you know, not intellectual. Um, but nonetheless, um, definitely a, a kind of a pessimistic viewpoint uh, on all these details. And we pretty soon get, get a good sense of why, right? Um, his, he intended to move into this rental property with his wife. Um, his wife very unexpectedly passed away. Um, and now he's kind of stuck there, right? And this property that um, he is not very happy with. Um, and I think we, we can see some pretty justifiable reasons why he would not be happy there. Um, on 197, um, there's a reference to this term sabbatical house. Um, and basically more to the point saying that he didn't want that, that, that Stoney was not looking for a sabbatical house. Um, and that's the kind of thing that, um, for, for, for me is very kind of secondhand. I, I know what sabbatical house, what he's talking about. Um, I realized for, for many of you, this might not be a, a natural term that you, that you would come to think of. Um, so this is the kind of thing where, uh, especially in a college town, I mean, so, so, you know, Las Vegas has UNLV, but I still wouldn't necessarily call it a college town. It's, you know, a part of the larger city. Um, but there are all these little college towns, you know, across, uh, the United States in particular, where everything kind of revolves around the college. It's a very small town that then is kind of centered around the, you know, 5,000 or 10,000 or 15,000 or 20,000 or, you know, whatever the number is, um, students who, who go to that college. Um, and so a sabbatical house the idea is um, it would be a house that usually a professor uh, would own and live in, and then they're going on sabbatical, which means that they're taking time away from their teaching duties and their ordinary, you know, duties of the college or university. Um, and oftentimes that, that time is used to go off and, you know, do research um, or to, you know, write, write a book in response to their research or to, you know, travel somewhere, uh, all, all those, those sorts of things. And so they're, they're not using their house for a semester or for a year, um, and they might rent it out. And, and oftentimes um, a sabbatical house would go to a, you know, a graduate student or, or an upper level undergraduate student who's really kind of trusted um, just to kind of, you know, be a presence in the house and water the plants and, you know, shovel the sidewalk if there's a snowy uh, kind of area those kinds of odds and ends. Um, 
But so th that's not what Stoney wants. Stoney is himself, you know, a, a full-fledged, you know, kind of grown-up. He wants a place where he can bring his own stuff uh, while, while he's renting this house. Um, instead, he feels like he's living um, in a sabbatical house, though, in, in a place where, you know, this is stuff that belongs to someone else, um, and I've got to make my life work kind of uh, amidst all of this stuff. Um, and there's this description that he gives. Um, this is on page, I think this is 200 here. Um, this is kind of midway down that page, kind of the middle of that big meaty paragraph there. Um, it says the dining room tablecloth had been painted with scrambled eggs and then scorched. The walls upstairs were bare and filthy. The walls downstairs covered in old art. The bookshelves were full. On the edges in front of the books were coffee rings and there was no other word for it, detritus. Uh, part of a broken key ring, more pencils, uh, half packs of cards. Um, and things like this word choice, word choice, excuse me, um, kind of um, further flesh out Stoney's character here, right? Um, there's no other word for it, uh, detritus or detritus. I think it's pronounced different ways in different circles. But not, nonetheless, um, literally what that means is kind of like the dead remains of a usually a plant or, or an organic life. Um, and so... Um, that's not literally what this is, right? That's that's not um, the only word for it because it could just be, oh, these are just things that people left behind, right? But he is putting a very pejorative kind of connotation on this. He's basically saying they're leaving like carcasses of uh, what their life was like and it's disgusting, right? That's the only word I can possibly use to describe it. Um, so again, f further fleshing out um, this character's, you know, point of view and, you know, kind of where he is in life um, at this particular moment. Um, on page 201 to 202, I'm not going to read this in, in large part just for... Um, to just just for the sake of time, uh, but it really actually going to yeah going to two o two here. Um, there, there's this email exchange between Stony um, and the woman he's renting the property from, um, where she talks about you know like we 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 clean the house for you. It's it's you know perfectly fine. Um, you're asking a lot for a nine month rental. Maybe this isn't what you're accustomed to. So on and so forth. Um, and he gets enraged about this. And, and I actually, uh, I feel for Stoney in this moment, right? Because she references that they cleaned it, you know, back in the spring. Uh, we had some people live there for the summer. Um, it should still be clean, right? Um, and he's saying, like, well, well, no, they, it's not clean now, right? And wh whether that's the fault of having done it, you know, too far in advance or whether it's because people live there in between. Uh, I'm renting this pop property. I'm paying for it. So it should be clean. Um, so, so I, personally, I sympathize with him, but, but again, I think that this is a space where depending on your, your living standards and, and cleanliness and all that, I could see having kind of deferring viewpoints on that. Um, but, but it leads to, I think, one of the big reveals of the story. I'm going to cut ahead a little bit just, just for the sake of time here. But, uh, when we get to 208, um, we, we get a clearer sense of, um, why the house was left the way that it was, right? And we and uh, we get Sally kind of being upset with Stony um, because he only lived in the house for nine months and he changed so many things. And, and she claims that he erased twenty five years of, of their history um, and talks about all the things that she left behind in the house that he saw as clutter or in the way um, that that she may have seen as the best things that she left behind for him to use. And I think to to me that that's kind of the heart of this story and that that's why the story has always stuck with me. Why I like to teach it. Um, this sense that our perception on the same stuff, the same place, can be so different depending on kind of where we're coming from. Um, if you're the person who previously lived in this house, if these items are things that meant, meant something to you at some point, um, this might all feel like um, I've given you such a, a wonderful place to live. Whereas if you're someone who has no context for all of this stuff and didn't want it in the first place, it can be, wow, this is a miserable living situation that you have forced me into. So... Uh, in any event, I, yeah, I, I just sort of think it's a, an interesting piece, to say the least, uh, with, with you know, a lot packed in there. Um, but okay, so for our, our final few minutes here, I want to go ahead to uh, the Erica Trable piece, um, A List of Concerns. Um, first of all, just to draw attention to the, the format of this as a list. Uh, I'll, I'll leave this as a question. I didn't leave you very many questions for McCracken, though please feel free to weigh in with you know, impressions and takeaways and thoughts there. But for uh, Treybold, um, the first question I'll pose to you is, um, what, why pose this in the form of a list? Because um, I think that is a very purposeful choice that, that she made here. Um, Let's kind of to number eight on the list. Um, well, actually, I'm going to lead up to it with um, number seven. Number seven, wear black to a funeral. Number eight, in lieu of flowers, send money. Um, and I want to ask why number eight would be a concern. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll flesh it out a little bit here, but I'll also try to leave some room for discussion. Um, you know, a, a, it alludes to the fact that someone died, which in and of itself, I think would be a concern. Don't send flowers, you know, send money that that's more practical. Like many of us have heard that sentiment before. Um, 
But there's also sort of, um, I would suggest a level of shame in that, right? Like, don't send me the, the pretty symbolic thing. I need money, right? And th there is a practical concern to that, too, because, um, you know, anyone who's ever managed the affairs of someone, um, you know, who has passed away or is you're trying to organize their affairs because they anticipate that they will before long, um, all this funeral stuff isn't cheap, right? Uh, funeral homes don't give you um, a coffin. They don't cremate a body for free. Um, there's no free gravestones. Um, even if you lose, you know, a, a child, you know, someone is lost during childbirth, um, things like that, um, you still have to pay for, for all sorts of things related to that. And so there's this principle that um, in lieu of flowers, send money. Um, you know, could be seen as like we're, we're in dire straits. We're poor. We need money more than we need, you know, nice little flowers. Um, could also be sort of, a, again, almost a point of embarrassment of like we, we just sort of need uh, money right now. So if you're going to send us something, please just give us that. Um, which nonetheless, so I, I think th those are some ways of, of getting into this. And I think, again, part of what I, I so appreciate about um, this essay in general is I feel like almost all of the list items you can really drill into further and kind of pull meaning from. Um, some of it, depending on your, your read of the larger essay and how these different items speak to each other in many cases, um, and some of it just based on your own experience uh, in life or as a reader uh, and how you kind of understand these things. Um, so to jump ahead to number 13 here, um, there's a shift here as it were introduced to some characters. Uh, we, we meet uh, Allie and Carrie um, and the narrator more as a person, um, Erica Trable. This is, you know, written autobiographically. She has very publicly owned that. Um, and I'm curious, the effect of adding kind of people here at this point, because again, up until 13, there are some suggestions of, of people, especially number 10, you know, gets into, um, you know, w when we were kids that implies, you know, Trable and her friends uh, when they were younger. But um, number 13, we get explicit names or are positioned more in a moment. And we, and we kind of ebb and flow from that. We go back and forth, you know, into, um, you know, more abstract thought or, you know, quick kind of principles. But um, what the effect is of introducing characters at number 13 in this list? Because um, that's, you know, a little ways in here, but, but it's also, you know, not terribly late in. Because, again, when we have a total of, um, what is it, 91, yeah, 91 different items, you know, number 13 isn't so far in. But any of I'm, I'm just curious to, to reactions that are why we think that choice uh, may have been made. Um, in 22 to 25, I'm not going to read these aloud right now, but there's all these references to the prairie and the prairie being something lost. Um, and I, I'm curious as to just what, what sense we make of that. What, what is the prairie in this context? What does it mean for it to be lost? What might that represent? Um, in number 26, there, there's this mention of um, adventure used to be Trebolt's favorite word. Uh, why would that be a concern? What does it mean that, that adventure was her favorite word? What does it mean with the implication it's no longer her favorite word? Uh, and in either case, you know, what, why would that be listed as a concern? Um, Okay, there, there's a relationship, particularly with Carrie, where she's someone who, um, you know, Trebold kind of fesses up to sort of bullying and sort of looking down on um, at different stages in their life, accusing her of stealing that pen and all the, the drama that came back from that. Um, and the, the, con the, the situation in which, um, you know, she references Carrie's mom um, committing suicide. Uh, this is uh, number 81, um, where she, she wants to offer condolences, but also doesn't want to subject her to more pain. Um, that kind of conflict there, which I, I think is... Um, really an interesting conflicted moment here that I think is relatable. Um, if, if not for you now, I, th I think that you might be able to envision a time in your life when this might become relatable where there are these big life things, where there's people who are no longer actually in your life on a daily basis. And there's a real question as to what, what your role is. Like, like, do they want to hear from you? Does it mean anything to hear from you at this point? Uh, maybe it would, right? Um, but I'll, I'll say as someone who's a little, you know, far, farther along in life than most of you, um, I, I have relationships like that all over the place, right? With people where um, I haven't been in touch with them in, you know, 20 some odd years. Uh, people who I'm Facebook friends with, you know, and I'll like their posts here and there, they'll like mine, but uh, we don't really know each other anymore, right? We just haven't seen each other in well over a decade. Um, and so that question of, you know, does it mean something for me to offer condolences or to offer to help with something when I don't live anywhere near them, when I haven't talked to them in, you know, over a decade, uh, all of that. Um, just one other place I'll draw your attention. There, there's so much we could get into with this essay. Um, but, but number 53 um, is left blank. 
Uh, I don't think that that is a, a typographical error where Triple accidentally hit the enter key an extra time and you left one blank. Um, I, I think that there, there's some real reasons and there's plenty of room for interpretation around it. So I'm, I'm going to leave that one uh, as it stands there. So, okay, so uh, I look forward to you guys engaging with the McCracken story with the Treybold essay here. Um, and as always, please feel free to weigh in with questions towards the end of this semester as well and you relate to essay number three and so on and so forth. But uh, thanks everyone for watching and I'll catch you next time for our very last class.